owned and operated. The American people are waiting. Have you a statement? 1230 The Voice is WXCO Wausau. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we continue our verse by verse study through the book of Ephesians. We resume our study today in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is true. In Jesus' name, amen. This is God's will for us if we are Christians. Verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Here it is. Walk as children of light. Walk like you belong to God because you do. We shouldn't be surprised when the unsaved do not know their right hand from their left when it comes to morality. We shouldn't be surprised when they don't act like Jesus. Why should they? The Bible says they're in spiritual darkness. But Christians are not in darkness. We've come out of darkness. With Christians, it's not that we don't know what is right. Our issue is to do what we know is right. And by the way, that's what real Christians want to do. Verse 9, speaking of right, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Some people live in sin and yet insist that they are right with God. Because of that, and to clear up any confusion that might be out there, God says, if you are walking in the light, if you are walking with me, then these things will characterize you. You will be good and you will speak truth. And by the way, good and truth are defined by God's word, not by what people think they are. Verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. As we live a good life, our understanding of what pleases God will increase. In other words, discernment of truth increases as our obedience increases. The longer we live for Jesus, the more discerning we become. Eventually, we get to the point where even something that is only slightly off kilter spiritually stands out to us. And that's where we should be, as God's people. Verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Have no fellowship with it. And the works of darkness would include sin and any teaching or belief which contradicts Scripture. These works of darkness, God says, are unfruitful. In other words, they are a waste of time and a waste of energy, believing contrary to Scripture, behaving contrary to Scripture, is like planting a garden in a sandbox. All your energy is going to be for nothing. Only sin is worse than planting a garden in a sandbox. It's more like planting a garden in a sandbox that is filled with poisonous vipers that pop up and bite you. It's destructive as well as useless. And so he says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Don't take a neutral stand with sin and false teaching. God says reprove them. And of course, today, if a, a preacher or any Christian, for that matter, takes a stand against sin, they are labeled harsh and narrow-minded and judgmental. They're accused of having a critical, critical spirit for simply pointing out right and wrong. Right and wrong? The world's that. Of course, many in the world today say there is no right and there is no wrong. There's no objective truth. That's what many people think. Right is what I want to do and wrong is what I don't want to do and leave it at that. 
and you are harsh and narrow-minded and judgmental to say that something is morally wrong today simply because the Bible says so. Well, people will say what they will say, and who cares? When you speak the truth and you point out what is sinful, you are simply exposing the works of darkness, and that is part of our job as children of God, and it is especially the job of a preacher. Verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. And I don't see a whole lot of shame today. I don't see a whole lot of embarrassment when certain sins are talked about today. In fact, I see a lot of people demanding the right to not just commit, but flaunt their sin. Some of the sins which are flaunted today are the same sins that were too shameful to even mention when I was growing up in the 1960s. This is an indictment on the world that we live in. But more than anything, it is an indictment on preachers who for far too long have been afraid to preach against sin, specific sins by name. And now, after decades of that, it's become morally acceptable. Verse 13, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever does make manifest is light. Spiritual light it's talking about. Consider this, two people in a room, okay? Both unsaved sinners. Both talking filthy. Both feeling comfortable doing it. Then a Christian enters the room and does not join their conversation and does not laugh at their filth. Without even realizing it, that Christian has just shined a bright spotlight on the moral filth of those sinners. And if their hearts are not hard beyond repair, they're going to feel some discomfort. They may say, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? Why don't you join in? What's the matter with you? Why don't you laugh? What's the matter with you? Well, nothing's the matter. You just feel guilty, that's all. The Holy Spirit just made you feel guilty. The light of God, the light of holiness, just exposed your sin, and that's why you feel guilty. God wants his people to be holy. If we are not, then he doesn't have a witness in this world. If God's people are not holy, if we simply join in with the sinful people of the world, then no one ever repents. Repent of what? How can they repent when they don't feel any guilt? How will anyone repent if their sin isn't exposed by the holiness of Christians and by the word of God? They won't. 14, therefore he says, Awake, you that sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. To lukewarm Christians, God says, wake up and get holy. Let the light of God shine out from you. And of course, when you do that, it's going to anger some people. Some people are going to be upset. Some people are going to feel awful, awful uncomfortable in their sin. But you know what? Some people are going to think twice about their sin. And even a small remnant is going to repent and receive Christ. But one thing is certain. No one repents because they're in the presence of a Christian who acts like a lost, hell-bound sinner. So God says, wake up, you Christians who are spiritually asleep. If you rise from the dead, spiritually speaking, Christ will give you light and you'll have an effect. 15. See then that you walk carefully not as fools, but as wise. In the Bible, a fool is someone who rejects Christ, someone who rejects the Word of God. Fools go to hell because fools reject Jesus. Anyone who doesn't take advantage of all that Jesus has provided for us through his death on the cross, and he knows what it is, he knows that it's real, is a fool. Refusing to give up the temporary pleasures of some sin 
and burning in hell forever as a result is a bad deal by anyone's definition. Someone says, well, I don't mind being a fool. Not now. But after two seconds in hell, you're sure going to mind. So God says Christians uh, should not act like fools. 15 and 16. See then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. The days are evil. The only people who do not see that the present times are full of evil are those who have acquiesced to the evil themselves. They are too engrossed in the filth of this world to recognize that it's abnormal. And so God says, be careful. Take heed that you don't start thinking that sin is normal. Once a person starts thinking like that, there's no guarantee that they'll snap out of that mindset. Verse 17, Therefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is because it's not that difficult, okay? Christians sometimes treat God's will as if it's a mystery. But it isn't. God's will is very clear. Do not sin. Do not sin, but if you do sin, confess and repent. That's God's will. Do nothing contrary to Scripture. That's God's will. You as a Christian are free in Christ to do anything within the bounds of Scripture. You don't have to go crazy trying to figure out if God wants to eat hamburger or pizza for supper. Or whether you should live in the city or live in the country. Or drive a Ford or a Chevy. It doesn't matter. God's will is stay within the bounds of Scripture. And within those boundaries, there's a whole lot of room to roam. Of course, it's important to make choices prayerfully. But make choices prayerfully and within the guidelines of Scripture, you'll be okay. Verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, in which is excess. To anyone who thinks that being a drunk is a disease, consider the Word of God. Did you ever notice that God never commands us to not get a sore throat? He never says, bring a sin offering when you get the flu. God never says, thou shalt not get cancer. He doesn't say, heart disease is an abomination to me. He doesn't say those things because they are illnesses. They are diseases. And you can't simply repent of being sick. However, God certainly does say, do not get drunk. And he does say, that drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He never says people who have cancer will never inherit the kingdom of heaven. But he does say that about drunks. Why? Because drunkenness is not a sickness. It is not a disease. Oh, you can get hooked on it. It's a habitual sin. Like in uh, any sin, you can get hooked on any sin. But it doesn't make it a disease. And we don't do anyone favors by telling them that it is. And I can understand the world calling it a sickness because they're spiritually dead. But I don't understand how preachers can call it that. It is a sin that can be forsaken, not a disease that must be cured. And someone says, Moret, you're being too harsh. You're being too unloving by calling it a sin. I am not. It's just the opposite. I am being very loving. Those who say that it is a disease are being harsh. And here's why. When people understand the truth, that they are committing sin, and that they don't have a disease, they, they can have hope because the choice then becomes theirs. God has given us a free will. A person committing sin is not locked into it like someone who's locked into cancer. A sinner simply has to repent. My dad would have been thrilled to be able to repent of the lung cancer, which eventually killed him. My mother would have been thrilled to be able to repent of the aneurysm that killed her. But they couldn't do that because those things are diseases, not sin. And that's the difference between a disease and sin. And by the way, 
no one has any right to define something as a sickness once God has already defined it as a sin. How dare any preacher even consider doing something like that? You got scrambled eggs for brains if you do that. What's the matter? In case they haven't noticed, they're altering the holy word of God, something which the Lord over and over again warns us not to do. Don't mess with my word. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Time for a break. We'll be back in one minute. Please listen to this. You're listening to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. This is by the way. We're hearing these days that the first of the baby boomers have now turned 65 years old. Included are such well-known individuals as President George W. Bush and former President Bill Clinton. Some are saying that 60 is no longer to be considered old, but that those who are 60 and above can still be considered vibrant and active, with a whole lot of life left to live. Well, those of us who are in the baby boom generation are happy to hear that others have not ripped us off as being completely over the hill. It's always been true that people can be happy and productive and hopeful at any stage of life. There are new opportunities to experience life to the fullest and to be blessings to those around us. So whatever your age, thank God for the wonderful gift of life. This is by the way. And you are listening to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. If you'd like to be a part of this ministry, that would be wonderful. Please pray for us, would you? Pray that God would use His Word and bless it as we give it out verse by verse. And if you are praying, I would appreciate hearing from you. You can write me at Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau. 54402-2211 or you can email me at versebyverse at live.com that's versebyverse at live.com thank you for standing with this ministry as we give out the word of God and now back to our study in God's word we are in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 let's read it again God says be not drunk with wine in which is excess but be filled with the spirit Sin is a sorry substitute for the good things that God offers. Like here, for example, God says, don't get drunk. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so God makes the comparison between drunkenness and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why get drunk when you can be filled with the Holy Spirit? Someone says, well, I get drunk because I'm happy when I'm drunk. You don't know what happiness is until you've been filled with the Spirit, until you're walking in the Spirit. That's when true joy comes. I know people who get drunk when something bad happens. I I knew a person once who got drunk when his dad died. Well, that's a big waste waste of time. It doesn't solve anything. Someone says, yeah, but when I get drunk, it makes me feel better. No, it doesn't. That's a lie. You cannot possibly get drunk enough to make your problems go away or even forget your problems. Like a bad dream, they're always right there in your mind, and you know it. Being filled with the Holy Spirit and living for Jesus is the only thing that works. It's the only thing that can make things better permanently. Not just in this life, but in the next. And so look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's a happy person. And they're happy because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. It is natural for spirit-filled Christians to have the joy of the Lord which transcends all circumstances, good and bad. And then notice verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God, even the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for everything. That's a command. Thank Him for everything. Thank God for the good. That's easy enough. Thank Him for the fair. That's sometimes hard to do. But thank God for the bad that happens. And that is impossible to do apart from faith in His Word. The Bible says that God is working all things together for our good. If we believe that, then we can thank Him for everything, even the things that we do not like. And so sometimes God expects us to rise above our feelings 
and say, thank you, God. I don't like it. It's not my first choice. But I trust that it has been allowed by you for some good reason. 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. It is God's will for the Christian husband to be the head of the Christian home. Notice very carefully. The Christian husband to be the head of the Christian home. It is God's will for the wife to let her Christian husband lead. It is the will of God for a wife to serve her husband. And yes, it is also the will of God for a husband to serve his wife, as we will see in a couple of minutes. But right now, it's talking about a wife submitting to her husband. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. God demands order in the home. And he has ordained that the husband must be the leader. God wants husbands to be godly. He wants husbands to love Jesus, to go to church, to read the Bible, and to pray. In short, God wants Jesus to be the most important thing to a Christian husband, by far. Only then can a husband be the type of man that God wants him to be. I have said it before, and I'll say it again. The best advice that I could give any Christian man is this. Never marry a woman who will not let you lead. And to a Christian woman, I would say, do not marry any man who you don't think is godly enough to lead and therefore would not trust to lead. 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject unto their own husbands. No one in their right mind would say that Jesus should submit to Christians. No one in their right mind would say that the church should tell Jesus what to do. They would be completely backwards. And no one in their right mind, therefore, should suggest that it's okay for a Christian wife to have authority over her husband. That's not the way God set it up. A Christian wife is commanded by God to let her husband lead. That means she should let him lead in spite of her feelings at times. It means she should let him lead without complaining, just exactly as the Bible teaches that Christians should submit to Jesus in spite of their feelings and without complaining. And that's not to say that there shouldn't be dialogue between a husband and a wife. Any Christian man with half a spiritual brain would want the input of his godly wife. Of course. But, at the same time, the husband is the one who will stand before God and answer for what goes on in that home. And I know that what I'm saying is going to go over like a lead balloon with any non-Christians who happen to be listening. And that's okay because God's not even talking to you. This message is for Christian husbands and Christian wives, and that's it. Of course, I also know that this message will go over like a lead balloon with many Christians who hear it. And to that I say... You have let the world influence your thinking more than the Holy Word of God. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Here's the flip side. In Scripture, love means to seek the greatest good of someone else. God wants Christian husbands to be good to their wives, to do what is in their best interest, to be good to her, even if she's not good back. That's how Jesus is toward us. By dying for us and paying for our sins, Jesus treated us as if we were worth more than he is. Consequently, a husband is to treat his wife like she is worth more than he is. Someone says, but my wife doesn't let me leave. My wife always gives me a hard time. My wife always is whining and complaining, and she doesn't submit like the Bible says. What should I do? You obey God. Just because she's disobeying God doesn't mean that you should. doesn't give you a license to do the same thing. You love her as if she was as submissive as the Virgin Mary herself. You say, well, that's not fair, and it certainly isn't easy. Well, since when has God said that doing the right thing would be fair and easy? That's not in the Bible. 
26, that he might sanctify and, <clears throat> excuse me, cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might, this is Jesus, um, dealing with the church, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. God commands husbands to care for their wives as they care for themselves. In other words, love your wife to the same degree that you love yourself. Someone says, well, I don't love myself. My counselors told me I don't love myself. Hogwash, poppycock, baldadash. Everyone loves themselves, as we will see in a minute. God wants a husband to strive to make his wife happy, to do what is in their best interest. In short, husbands should love their wives as they do their own selves. Someone says, again, I don't love myself. Well, look at what God says in verse 29. For no man, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. It is a myth, an unbiblical, unscriptural myth to suggest that some people do not love themselves. We not only love ourselves, according to God, we cherish ourselves. And that's okay. God has placed self-love in people so that they will take care of themselves. And of course, caring, caring for self sometimes is done in a twisted, sinful way because of our sin nature, but people very definitely do nourish and cherish themselves. There's no question about that. People want to like how they feel. And people want to like how they look because they cherish themselves. People get upset when they don't like how they look or how they feel or when something, something else that they don't like about themselves becomes apparent. They don't feel good. Why? Because they cherish themselves. You can search the Bible from cover to cover and you will never see God commanding his people to love themselves. He doesn't have to because self-love is a given. And so he says in verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. God is saying that people love themselves, watch this, with the same intensity that Christ loves the church. Well, that's a whole lot of self-love. And that is the same kind of self-sacrificing, caring love that God wants a Christian man to have for his wife. 30. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. All this talk about a man and his wife in this chapter is designed to illustrate the relationship between Jesus and his church. The wife was made for her husband just as the church was made for Christ. The husband is to care for his wife just as Christ cares for the church. 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she respect her husband. A Christian marriage, in other words, should be mutually submissive, mutually loving, and self-sacrificing. A husband should love his wife and be ready to sacrifice in order to meet her needs. A wife should submit to her husband and be willing to sacrifice to meet his needs. And when those things happen, you have a happy family. There's no other way. No one needs any other kind of marriage counseling beyond that. Because if they're not willing to do that, nothing else will work anyway. And if they are willing to do that, they won't need anything else. Questions, comments, you can write me. Scripture verse by verse, Post Office Box 22. 1 1 Wasa, Wisconsin, 54402 2211. That's scripture verse by verse, post office box 2211 Wasa, 54402. We invite you to listen to the radio worship service 